Connectric creates opportunities for people living with disabilities by providing information, resources, and programming geared towards greater inclusion and quality of life. Check out some of the programs we offer through our online learning platform, Connect Together, including our Service Mondays, where we highlight a local organization or initiative. Wednesday Chair Yoga with Bobby Seal Kobiski. Thursday Adapted Fitness with Megan Williamson. Friday Rotating Dance Classes hosted by Janice Lawrence and Joanne Cuff. And other initiatives including presentations by the Disabled Independent Gardeners Association's Growable Program and our Perspective Series. Also coming up on July 22nd, we have an Accessible Community Forum on Accessible Housing in British Columbia. Check out our updated programs calendar on our website, connectra.org, or find us on Facebook at Connectra Society. Okay. Awesome. Thanks, Kazer. Welcome everybody to our perspective series on navigating technology with a disability. My name is Emily. I am the Connectra program coordinator and perspective series are something we started, mm, I'd say about six months ago, and we're doing them the third Monday of every month on a different topic. Um, we bring together a panelists who have some expertise in the field that we're talking about and it's really an open discussion. So for everyone that's in attendance here, um, you, you should be able to unmute yourself. And if you're not, you can just say in the chat um, that you have a question and we can unmute you and you can, you can ask it out loud or you can put your question in the chat and I will ask it for you. Um, I do just ask that if you are not speaking, you do keep your microphone on mute just to eliminate background noise. Um, yeah, and if there uh, are any questions throughout, let's just go with the natural flow of the conversation, but don't be afraid to chime in if you have a uh, comment or sort of uh, want to add to the conversation that's already going on. Really just like this to be an open, free-flowing, community-driven conversation. So I'm going to start off by introducing our panelists. So first up, I will introduce Alyssa Roseman. So Alyssa completed her Master's of Science in Occupational Therapy at McGill University in 2013 and has over 10 years experience in the field working with individuals with disabilities. Alyssa provides ergonomic worksite and assistive technology assessments and recommendations for a wide variety of clients to help find and sustain employment. Through both her professional work as an occupational therapist and volunteer work in adaptive outdoor pursuits, Alyssa has been consistently inspired by how ever-evolving assistant technology can break down barriers, enable independence, and empower clients to participate in meaningful activity. And Alyssa is wearing her Neil Squire shirt. <laughs> Alyssa, anything to add? Uh, just happy to be here and looking forward to, uh, to chatting about assistive technology. Awesome, thanks so much. Next up, we have Amanda. Amanda, can, am I saying this correctly? Rayum? Sure. No, uh, <laughs> no it's, it's actually, it's very, you're, you're pronouncing it right in that it's Rayum in French, but my family is from a Southwestern Ontario where we, where we pronounce it Rayum. Rayum. Yeah, we don't, or, we don't pronounce Rayom. it right. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Love it. Amanda is a content marketing manager for a database startup. She became interested in tech after a severe head injury left her with visual processing disabilities that made using computers difficult. That led to a fascination with accessible and ethical technologies, which opened up doors to writing about the future of tech. Currently, she writes for a number of large technology companies and consultancies on topics like cybersecurity, data strategy, IT strategy, the future of enterprise technology, and more. Thanks for being here, Amanda. Anything you want to add? No, I'm just, thank you for inviting me. I'm yeah. sorry that I was running around. I, my head, my microphone wasn't working, but this one seems to be working fine. <laughs> you, you sound great. Come okay. Clear. 
And last but not least, we have Glenn Barnes. So over the past 30 years, Glenn has gained extensive experience working as a consultant in a wide variety of policy development, governance training, strategic planning, almost all in a variety of work in accessible, accessibility and disability related issues. Through each of those experiences, technology has played a large role in Glenn's ability to participate. After a spinal cord injury dictated that his primary writing aid would be a computer or smartphone or tablet using various iterations of voice dictation. So Glenn has had to gain an understanding of screen readers and other technological aids, such as bliss boards and augmentative communication devices, all used in conjunction with himself and other individuals participating in company, board development, strategic planning, event execution, workshop facilitation, and motivational speaking. Glenn also works in funds development for our Tetra team here at the Disability Foundation. Glenn, did I get everything? <laughs> There's a lot there. <laughs> yeah, everything's good. I, I actually don't work in funds development anymore. I've kind of stepped back a little bit and uh, still work with Tetra, but not in funds development. Okay, well, Tetra's much, happy to have. Too much work and too depressing that 90% 90, <laughs> 90 of the time you get rejected, so. Funds development can be depressing, <laughs> for sure. Well, happy to have you here. Um, yeah, I actually wanted to start things off with you, Glenn, if we could. Okay. Uh, wondered if you wanted to talk a little bit about the event that caused your spinal cord injury and how old you were and how it sort of changed your life and your relationship to technology specifically. Yeah, sure. Um, probably dating myself a little bit, but um, I had finished university and um, was working as a teaching assistant because I was not able to get into a very competitive um, teacher's college in Ontario at that time, limited numbers and tons and tons of applicants. And so um, went into the teaching assistant uh, role for a year. And then the summer I got off is when I ended up diving into a pool. It wasn't even really a party, it was just, kind of a few friends over goofing around and um, I hit my head on the bottom of the pool and snapped my neck back and broke my neck. And uh, that landed me down in a rehab facility in Toronto. Um, a, a little time later, it took me a while to get through all the hospital stuff and everything first. And um, really my first foray into technology was um trying to use a computer i mean i knew the general ins and outs of a computer but all through my university um a computer really wasn't a thing yet um all the papers and um you know stuff that we did for the requirements of every course um, most of it we would send out to a lady who worked down the street that typed everything up on a typewriter and she would charge X amount of money per word. And, um, yeah, that's how we did all of our stuff back then. So I knew how to use a computer. And when I was working at the school, they did have computers there, but it wasn't the kind of thing where every kid in every class had a computer. There was a computer room and it had about 30 archaic looking desktop computers in it. And, um, you know, it would get used by four to six different classes in a day. Um, but that's it, you know, so even the kids at that time were really only getting maybe an hour-ish work on a computer. And so when I got to the rehab center, I kind of knew what I was doing enough on the computer to be comfortable, but you know, my typing was a little less than desirable. My injury caused me to be a quadriplegic and um, I lost all dexterity in my hands and, and fingers and everything. So 
my first foray, really like significant foray into technology was with Dragon Dictate. And preparing for this, I was kind of thinking back upon that time. And it probably sounds a, a little ridiculous now. And as I tell the story, you're probably going to think to yourself, man, that guy looks pretty young for like 100 year old information kind of thing. Um, because that's probably what it's going to sound like. But believe it or not, um, take a pretty large dining room table and fill it up completely with computer equipment. Have a microphone sitting in front of you that is something that you would see on a stage normally for a singer or a musician. And in order to get the computer to work with you with the Dragon Dictate, um, you had to put in 45 hours of training into the computer. So you would start off, it was all kind of written in a book, but you would start off with, hi, hi, my name is, hi, my name is Glenn, you know, and you've just, keep going with all those crazy sentences until you trained it well enough that it could recognize your voice. And the real kicker to the whole thing was the fact that Dragon Dictate at that time, if you wanted to purchase it, was $16,000. Yeah. Yeah. So that was really my big foray into it. By the time I left the rehab center, um, I had gone to what sounded like somebody like Al, uh, Alyssa, um, who at a writing aids clinic prescribed me a computer and printer and all the rest of the stuff. And then I started getting quite a bit more serious into it. And uh, that was really the, the big introduction, I guess. So, um, yeah. Wow. So I'm hoping Dragon has come a long way from being the size of a dining table and 45 hours of training and $16,000. Yeah. But yeah, so it sounds like you kind of came into your injury at the same time that you were sort of coming into technology. So I know, yeah. 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 So, so maybe your, your experience with it has sort of um, been from that perspective the whole time, right? Yeah, yeah a little bit. Yeah. And then in the introduction, you'd kind of mentioned things like screen readers and um, CCTVs and things like that. None of that stuff that I use, but um, one of my jobs for, well, I think it was probably a three-year contract, was working with the uh, local group of um, Coalition for Persons with Disabilities. And in order to disseminate information, out some of our clients required screen readers or cctvs or other augmentative communication devices so i quickly had to learn about those as well and the primary job of the coalition for persons with disabilities was to find other people with disabilities employment so then it would be taking those the knowledge of those types of um technologies to employers to say would you consider buying this for an employee or would you consider cost sharing or if we got a grant from the government to pay for one of these quite expensive devices would you hire this person with a disability so it all hedged around will help you with wage subsidy or will help you with technology purchases if you agree to hire that person and not hire them for six months, but, you know, hire them for a contract of three to five years kind of thing. So that's when I had to learn about all those other different technologies as well. And, you know, as things evolved, um, you know, it got into, you know, scanning devices, um, you know, like today, um, almost all of the 
forms and things that you get sent maybe from a government or a doctor or whoever, you're able to just fill out your information on the form. Yeah. Before, what you had to do was print it, get somebody to help you to write in the tiny little boxes when you don't have good dexterity, and then copy it, and then scan it, and then send it back to whoever it was you were sending it to. So yeah. um, believe it yeah. or not, you know, I'm not that old. I'm 53. So <laughs> these things kind of evolved over pretty much the 30 years of my disabled life that um, are now, you know, commonplace. And I mean, the fact that we're even on this call right now is kind of funny and ironic because, um, you know, one of the biggest challenges we had finding other people with disabilities employment when I worked with the local coalition here was that employers always wanted an employee to come in in person. And they always wanted to be in front of a panel of interviewers. Mm -hmm. Now you're dealing with people with very high anxiety levels. Sometimes the person would be blind or deaf. Um, they would often need somebody there with them to help interpret or other ways of communicating. So we used to try and advocate for an interview over the computer before many, 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 many years ago. And no employer would ever, ever go for it. No, it has to be in person. No, we have to see them. We have to be able to, you know, watch them wheel into the office or right. walk into the office or whatever it might be. And now and we're here. Now we're here. And you know, I'm sure Amanda will be able to expand on this, but every major employee now is like, oh, sure, three quarters of our, our staff can work from home and mm -hmm. they can do Zoom and we can have meetings on Zoom and, you know, Microsoft Teams and all the other yeah. stuff. And now it's kind of commonplace. And it's kind of funny because it was all perpetuated by, you know, a, a major world event. And it's funny that a major world event actually improved the playing field for people with disabilities when it comes to technology. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Amanda, thank you so much for sharing all that, Glenn. Um, Amanda, I'd love to sort of ask you the same uh, sort of in relation to your head injury and how it changed your relationship with technology and sort of some of the work that you're doing when it comes to working with people with disabilities right now. Yeah, um, when I, I was injured about five years ago, and my story is, is not very exciting. I dropped a weight on my head at the gym. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, and um, at first, you know, I was just told I went to the I went to the doctor and they just said, Oh, if you just have a concussion, you'll be fine in two days. Um, and uh, that was the beginning of three weeks of bed rest. Uh, where I um, was having such severe symptoms. And at the time, the advice was to wait until you stopped having symptoms, which is wrong advice. Don't do that. Um, you're supposed to, you're supposed to be getting back right away to activity. Um, but so I, I, my first experience was obviously, if you have what you think is a, you know, a concussion, you don't look at, you don't look at technology. Um, so that was when I really started. Uh, but I was, I was stuck in my, in my house alone. Alone, uh, for three weeks in my bedroom, unable to move uh, upon doctor's advice. Uh, but I was able, I didn't have symptoms listening to audiobooks. So actually, I actually listened to 200 hours um, of audiobooks in, in that period of time, uh, which is eight complete days. Um, <laughs> so, um, so, so that was kind of my, uh, my love affair with, with tech. That was the beginning of my love affair with technology. Uh, I am, I have an English degree. I'm a writer, um, and, uh, books were my life. Um, and so I, I, uh, I had visual issues with scanning and reading, um, books. I still have issues with that, but they're not as severe, but because of the other visual issues I have by the time I get around to reading, um, I usually can't do that. So I primarily use, um, a uh, text to voice app called Voice Dream. 
Uh, and um, I have, um, because of my visual disabilities, I have access to um, CELA, uh, which is the um, uh, disability library for those with visual issues. Um, for those who don't know, if you have a visual disability, um, there's an agreement uh, that was made um, with publishers that they would provide um, books free of charge to these, um, these libraries who would then make them accessible for various people who have different kinds of disabilities. Um, so I get access to this library. I can download as many books as I want um, in whatever format I want. Um, I like Daisy text um, files, uh, and then I, um, I can keep them forever. So, <laughs> um, but the thing is that after listening to books for, uh, after using audio as a primary way to take in information um, for so many years, uh, I now can listen to, I can listen very fast. Like if you're on um, Audible, for example, I, I can go all the way up to 3.5 times. Um, but if you, uh, but in voice stream, it can go up to 700 words per minute and I can, um, I can understand that. And this is something that's very common, um, for anyone who have, has visual impairments or visual disabilities is that because they're, they're reading screen readers or they're using, um, other forms of audio, uh, based information <laughs> processing, they actually become, they, they typically become quite quite adept at listening to it very quickly. So if I play, my fun party trick is that I like playing um, my audio books at the, at the level that I'm, I'm used to listening to them myself. And no one can understand a single word because it's just like, a <laughs> it just all blends together. But my brain can pick up the differences and listen to it really quickly. This is actually like a superpower, basically, because I read 500 books in 2020. And uh, generally, I write, read several hundred books um, a year. Uh, and uh, it's also really effective in, in a worker, in, in the work that I do, which is as a content marketing uh, professional. So I onboarded at a new job recently, and I could watch all the training videos at 2 or 2.5 times the speed. Um, and then I could also just download stuff and listen to it. Um, so that's that's kind of one aspect of my relationship with technology. Um, I so so then once I was finally able to start looking at screens, um, I had um, I had a lot of various different um, issues with it. So uh, I've tr I had tracking issues where my 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 um, eyes weren't tracking properly. I have problem with motion. I still can't watch video. Um, in fact, I'm wearing an assistive device right now. These are special prism glasses um, that, you know, mean that my brain won't melt down by participating in this webinar and being on video um, because my my brain uh, just can't uh, process video very well. And then it starts losing other capacities and I get very brain fogged. Sometimes I develop aphasia. Sometimes I develop balance issues or I get super fatigued. Um, so that's kind of those are that's kind of like the cluster of symptoms I have when um, when I'm pushed uh, by technology for example, um, that isn't accessible to me to, um, to, to be pushed past my limit. So essentially, I had to, you know, start by spending 15 minutes uh, a, a day or at a time on a computer and slowly build up. Uh, because of that, I was off work for, um, for six months, um, which luckily I had a, a um, I, I worked at an employer that gave me six months of sick leave um, uh, as just like something they, they gave to everyone. Um, but but uh, but it was quite it was quite difficult. I, I, I honestly like the challenge of people who have head injuries, which I think is a challenge that a lot of other people with disabilities have as well, is that um, our physiotherapy and our treatment aren't isn't covered by insurance. Uh, so in my first year on um, neurovestibular physiotherapy, which involved eye related um, treatments, and then when I eventually went to go see um, uh, an, um, you know, a visual therapist who specialized in head injuries, I spent over six thousand dollars out of pocket. Um, just going to uh, to do things that I actually needed and, and would not have been able to return to work if I hadn't ha hadn't been able to access it. And um, I was uh, I was also at the time a fundraiser, um, and I've, I've since switched to to tech. But um, I was lucky that I was at a point in my career where I was kind of mid level, where I was making enough money to to afford that. And then when I returned. Um, I wasn't doing a lot of admin work um, in my role. 
Um, so, so there was, um, there was some flexibility, um, going back, but I mean, it was, it was such a, um, uphill battle to get accommodations at work around technology. Um, I still, I, I'm actually, uh, in the last maybe six to eight months I've improved, but I, I couldn't use spreadsheets, um, spreadsheets because of the, all of the grids and lines, my, my eyes did not like grids and lines, um, would cause my brain to melt down. So I needed a few hours a week of support to do um, spreadsheet and data entry in any kind of programs. Um, a lot of, you know, enterprise level technology doesn't actually have um, a lot of accessibility options. Um, so any kind of content, uh, contact management solutions or other options, um, there, there's really not a lot of accessibility ways you can, you can, you, you know, um, make changes to it so that it's more accessible. Um, I also found there's there's not a lot. So another visual issue I have is photophobia. Um, I'm, I am very, very sensitive to um, light, but I, I didn't realize that that was part of the problem until um, the iPhone develop, uh, created the dark, dark mode, which was, I think, in um, September 2019 when they finally implemented that. Um, and I had always used dark mode in, on Twitter um, and it was so much better. It was like the one kind of thing, like I just didn't put two and two together and my visual therapists weren't aware of this either. But as soon as that changed, um, my ability to use screens increased. Um, so that was when I started going on a journey about how, like trying to figure out how I could um, deal with uh, my visual issues related to light um, from computer screens. Uh, so I, um, I, I started playing around and these, this existed the whole time, but because it's so specialized and because no one directed me towards it, um, uh, I was able to figure out that, you know, um, high contrast mode in, in windows, um, actually is really effective, uh, for me. And then over a period of four months, I played around with different colors, um, different text colors. At first I did white and black, and then I'm like, whoa, like the whiteness on the black is quite, is quite intense. Um, so I now have kind of a, um, I now use a, uh, kind of gray, um, color. So just slightly less, um, harsh. And then I also use, um, I also use something called Iris. I used to use Flux, which is an app that kind of shifts um, the color and the light by time of day and takes out um, the blue. Um, so that's that's been, so figuring that out actually like completely changed how much time I could spend on screens um, and increased my capacity. I had a lot of downsides though, because um, it, there's a lot of technology that doesn't, that isn't coded in a way that respects systems preferences. Um, so for example, so my systems preferences are the colors in my high contrast mode. Um, but let's say I'm using Google Docs. Uh, my Google Docs uh, will not, um, the, when I make a spelling mistake, it's supposed to underline it, right? And if you're using it normally, you're gonna see that underline. I don't because um, the color contrast isn't coded properly by Google. I have a friend who works at Google and she explained this to me <laughs> that it wasn't coded in a way that it picks up automatically on systems preferences. So that means that um, when I was working freelance for a client that used Google Docs and they were they were like, why are you sending this in with so many errors? And I'm like, they're like, can't you see them? And I'm like, there's errors? <laughs> There's spelling mistakes. Oh crap! Uh, and and so I had to like explain that to her. And then I I had to I had to like it was so onerous because I'd have to like undo my um, high contrast mode uh, and so that I could edit, uh, which was painful for me. And then I had to turn it back on. Um, and that was that was quite a lot. Uh, the other thing, the other, and this is relevant to to what Glenn was talking about, is that. Um, Dragon doesn't work for me. So I made a request because my visual therapist thought that when my eyes were tired, Dragon dictation would be a good um, uh, option. I will not get into this, but my employer at the time took 12 months to, no, 15 months to get it to me, even though it was only $300, um, which was fun. Uh, but by the time it finally got to me, well, I was so excited to have this assistive technology. And guess what? They also didn't code to respect systems preferences. So half 
of the functionalities didn't work. So if you've used Dragon, it's supposed to, um, uh, like when you're typing an email, that like something pops up and you're supposed to see yourself, you're, you're supposed to see yourself um, dictating it. it. That doesn't work on high contrast. Um, when you mistake a word and they're supposed to suggest alternatives, that doesn't work which is actually really disturbing because a lot of people who use it have visual issues and might also have photophobia and need to um, need need like high contrast mode or um, or something else. Uh, and so so one of the things that I'm really interested in as someone who's now in tech is how um, is, is about is about how development is done and uh, accessible um, technology. So I wrote I wrote an article about it um, a, probably in March, which was about how this the standards are made and how um, people think about in in on programming and engineering teams how they think about um, developing uh, technology. And usually they have these user profiles that are about you know single disabilities, whereas so many people who are disabled have these intersecting disabilities. Um, so so what ends up happening are things like that where there's this solution, Dragon, which would have been perfect for me, except that because I also have photophobia, I can't use it. It's, it, it's rendered unusable. Um, so so that's been um, that's been quite uh, a struggle. The other thing is I started at a, a company that only uses Apple. And I got my Apple computer. I was so excited. I had all my codes for high contrast for what colors I use um, from Windows. And I opened it up and they do not have the ability for you to specify high contrast and what colors you want your screen to be. So then I start crying to <laughs> my partners there. I'm like, oh no, what am I going to do? Like I'm starting at this new company and I can't even use the tech that they've sent me. Um, and luckily the person who was in IT was very kind about it and said that I could use my, um, my personal computer. Um, Apple also doesn't have um, a mate screen, which is something that I need as well. They only have glossy. So there's, there's a lot. So when you have like these weird <laughs> and intersecting visual issues and you're trying to use technology, there's all of these challenges that you run into. Uh, also, I've gone on quite a um, odyssey trying to trying out e-ink, thinking that e-ink would work for me. And I don't know if anyone knows what e-ink is, but it's if you've ever used a um, Kindle, it's the same technology there. And there are a number of different um, things that you can use uh, that have e-ink. Um, there's monitors. There's I have a Remarkable where if I wanted to like draft stuff. Um, it's it's an e-ink screen, and then I can I can email it to myself, and it, and it comes out in text, um, so it kind of interprets my handwriting, um, which has been helpful at times. Um, and I've tried a bunch of other e-ink screens, but they're still they refresh too often, um, or they degrade, and then and then you get shadows and other things. So I don't think that technology is there yet. But I also a friend bought me a e-ink cell phone. And that was helpful for a while um, while I was using while I was using that. So I used that for about eight months and it was really um, helpful. But they had to buy it from Korea and it's not actually compatible with most um, things. So a lot of the uh, a lot of the um, apps that I use, even some assistive apps that I that I really need, um, like uh, voice stream isn't available on their um, ecosystem, their app ecosystem. So it's been quite uh, an adventure trying to to navigate tech and trying to keep up with the movements that are happening towards more accessibility, but um, them be taking you know quite quite some time and not being fully integrated. Right. Yeah, the not being fully integrated or like adaptable crossover to Mac and whatnot is got to be super frustrating. Thank you for sharing. You mentioned so many good things in there, like Remarkable, E-Ink. You mentioned the Iris. You mentioned Prism glasses. It would be awesome if you linked some of these things in the chat or if you want to take some time putting together in an email afterwards to me, I'll make sure to share. I'll do that. Um, on our resource page. That would be awesome. Yeah. And same to your article. Oh, yeah, I can do that, that as, well. Your as well. Yeah. Okay. And Alyssa, I want to go over to you now as somebody who helps uh, make uh, adaptive devices. Can you just talk a little bit about how you got involved in working with people with disabilities? Is it mainly physical disabilities? What's some of the work that you're doing at Neil Squire? Um, so, unfortunately, I don't make any devices, but I do uh help find the right device for uh for each individual and their specific 
needs and their limitations. Um, so I got into technology uh, somewhat by chance, I always knew that I wanted to be an occupational therapist because I was lucky enough to have a mother who's an occupational therapist. And um, when it came time to go to university, I thought, well, she's always loved what she does and she makes such a huge difference with people. So that seemed like a great option for me. And it was only once I was in the middle of my master's degree that I had the opportunity to work with a really wonderful woman uh, who was living with muscular dystrophy. And it wasn't related to my OT degree at all. She just required uh, some help with computer input um, because she couldn't access a keyboard. She was looking for a, an administrative assistant and I needed some extra cash. So she hired me on for that. And um, I think more for my benefit than for hers, she let me tinker with some of the tech that she had at the time. So she was using an environmental control unit. Um, this only would have been maybe 15 years ago. It cost $10,000. Uh, it was really clunky. And all it did really was turn on her lights, turn on her television, um, open her door, all of the things that, you know, that a Google Home or an Alexa will now do for under $100. So the technology has really come a long way, even just in the time that, that I've been working with it. Um, but that's what really uh, turned me on to, to assistive tech. And uh, I discovered Neil Squire and I thought, you know, that's the perfect combination of assistive technology and work with people with disabilities and just seeing the the difference that um, that, that can make. So um, here I am and uh, I've forgotten what the question was. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, that's great. That's a great <laughs> intro. I was kind of asking how you got into it, what you did. That's how I got into it. Answer. And I grew and up then, in a household that was uh, very tech oriented, really yeah. fortunate on that front as well. So I had a, a computer in the house from a young age um, and uh, was always just encouraged to to use it, to try it out, to make mistakes, which I think unfortunately is a, is a really scary thing for someone who hasn't used a computer is, is the potential to make mistakes or to do something wrong and, and right. mess with some settings. Um, so just having used it my whole life, I, uh, I've always felt really comfortable with technology and yeah picking up a new new device and trying it out. And I try to encourage my clients to do the same. Yeah, so I would assume like you have to stay pretty up to date on the latest adaptive technology or are you kind of um, working with someone specifically and then you'll do research around their needs to see what can help them? Uh, both for sure. Okay. So um, I try to stay as up to date as possible. Um, but when it comes to working with a specific client, everybody is, is so different. Um, even with a similar disability or a similar employment goal, their needs are always going to be really unique. And so I'm constantly looking up um, new, new solutions and um, the internet is amazing for, um, for communities that have already solved that problem or um, are working on solving that problem as well. If I could jump in there for a second, um, it just reminded me of something. And that was when I was at the high school teaching and, and as I said, computers were there, but they really weren't a part of everyday school life at that time. Um, it, 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 was, it was a really tough time for people with disabilities. Now, I wasn't disabled yet, so I didn't really get that. But as technology started to pick up and became a better part of everyday school life, and they encouraged you to bring, you know, laptops in and, you know, it's kind of an on-off, on-off, on-off debate. But whether you use your, you know, your mobile or your cell, whatever you want to call it, in the um, classroom and whatnot, People with disabilities fell drastically behind at that time. 
because there were no other solutions for them. They'd never had any foray into computers at all. So whether it was somebody who was blind, who was deaf, who had visual issues, who uh, was physically disabled, um, they really, really, really fell drastically behind all of their classmates, which kind of exacerbated that level playing field and, you know, really led to what was the growth of something like a Neil Squire. You know, ideally, Alyssa would be working at Google or, you know, Apple or, but because technology, you know, started to take off so quickly and became so fragmented in terms of accessibility, the need for organizations like Neil Squire uh, became, you know, very necessary. Yeah, that's a really good point. I would definitely hope that they have a team at Google that works towards this this sort of goal of making everything accessible. Um, I know Microsoft uh, Microsoft has an occupational therapist on their accessibility team, um, but Google, I, I can't say for sure. I would hope so as well. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I I I I think that that is the bare minimum that people need. I think I think what's even more effective is to require every engineer to know these things, every programmer, everyone, every team and every um, you know, product that they're creating from the very beginning. And it's in the article that I that I wrote that I'll link to you for you guys yeah. um, to to understand these issues and to understand um how to include accessibility from the beginning. Like there's something yeah. called accessibility debt, which is that um, in, in technology, there's something called technical debt. And so accessibility debt is kind of like a play on that. And the idea with technical debt is like when you create um, inefficient code, just because it's easier or faster, eventually you're going to have to pay a lot of money to, to clean that up, to fix it, to make um, to make things more efficient. And the same thing with, with in accessible um, technology. Uh, if you are creating inaccessible apps, eventually mm -hmm. you or your company or your team are going to have to fix that. Um, and uh, potentially legally, you'll be legally obligated to do that. So it's it, it, needs to be, it needs to be baked into the entire industry and the whole, the whole profession, in yeah. my opinion. Totally. Yeah. And to go a step further even, you know, yeah, it could be Google, it could be Apple, it could be an OT working for them. But, you know, in a perfect world, it would be, you know, Joe with autism and Pete with other disability and Mary with another disability. And, you know, because this is the time that the technology is becoming so relevant to not just people with disabilities world, but everybody's world. Um, you know, you've got to take advantage of what it's like to live those challenges. I mean, Amanda's description of what she went through and really is still going through in terms of, well, I, oh, yeah, I started to use this and then I found yeah. it doesn't really mesh with that. And, you know, these things would be played out in the development if there was an autistic guy on the, you know, team and there was, you know, a team of, you know, and that's slowly happening, but I just know from my time at the coalition where we were finding people with disabilities employment, yeah. um, it is a burn to try and get somebody in just for an interview. Yeah. And every employer wants a wage subsidy. Every employer wants, you know, prepaid technology. There's this, and I'm sure Alyssa could back me up on this, but there's this huge myth out there that making your workplace accessible, making technology available to people with disabilities that they require for their specific disability costs the employer hundreds or 50,000, $10,000. And why would I hire that person if I can go get another person to work for me for nothing? You know, and, and yeah, or prepay, you know. Yeah. Or if and, I have to spend sixteen thousand dollars on on buying yeah. a dragon, yeah, yeah, I know. And that's slowly changing, but you know, it, it like I said, it took a pandemic to yeah let everybody be comfortable with Zoom. 
You know, right. and that, right, it was such a major issue before. No, right. no, no, we, we can't interview like that. We have to have the person in our office. Yeah. You know, those kinds of things. So, yeah. That, so this was actually one of the reasons why I decided to shift from fundraising into tech, into working in tech is because so many companies are what they're calling remote first, where they only have remote workforces or remote friendly, where they um, have whole teams where they encourage anyone who wants to work remotely. They also have um, uh, asynchronous hours and flexible working hours where you can work in like in your own time. So my boss um, was, you know, was telling me, hey, you know, if you want to um, if you're not feeling well, if you get fatigued halfway through the day, go take a nap. <laughs> you know, like it, it's not going it, it, to, and then just finish the, finish the work later or finish it, like work, work the next day, like just get, like, all we want is for you to get the work done. And you can do that in your own time and at your own, um, like listening to your body. Um, and I was like, okay, this is exactly, this is like a, a much more humane way to think about work. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> That's a good employer. Yeah. And, and, you know, we hope that like in facilitating conversations like these, more people do start to know about experiences like yours, Amanda, and like yours, Glenn, where, you know, they think about what it might be like to have a barrier like that or multiple barriers in front of them at the workplace. Mm -hmm. So um, we have a couple questions in the chat from Nate. Alyssa, what is the most impactful technology that you can think of right now that you're currently using with a client that is a true game changer? I'm super interested in this too, like some success stories maybe of some really cool things that have helped people out. Well, yeah. Um, not to put you on the spot. Um, it's a tough question because for each client, there can be a game changer and it can be something that would be thought of as, as a completely basic tool to someone else, but can be a game changer for someone's limitations. Um, the first thing that, that comes to mind for me would be speech recognition as a whole, um, not necessarily Dragon, but no, no, no. Um, that it's built in now yeah. by default to to every device that we have um, and fingers crossed continues to get better as well. Mm -hmm. um, the better it gets, the more of a game changer it is for someone to use, whether they um, don't have the, the use of their hands to use a keyboard and mouse, or they have um, cognitive challenges, visual challenges, learning disabilities. Um, the, the uses for speech recognition are so varied um, and really make make a huge, huge difference. Um, awesome, yeah, and I've come a long way, I'm, I'm sure. Yeah. A long way, so it no longer requires 45 hours, thankfully, no, of training. No. Um, Dragon now is really plug and play, so uh, it does learn with you, but um, from the very beginning, you can read one sentence and, and off you go. Um, so that's a big improvement. Um, awesome. And uh, cool. I'm looking forward to uh, to, uh, to dragon levels of speech recognition being built into Windows, which is hopefully um, in the near future. Yeah, I think what's kind of neat is dragon has fallen way off to the side as the relevant speech recognition, because now you can get it on a Google phone, an Android mm -hmm. phone. Um, you know, I use an iPhone, I think it's an eight now that I've got. Um, and I use that to dictate emails. I use that to dictate uh, text messages. I use that to, uh, with um, Apple Home, I use it to uh, open my door. I use it to turn on my lights. And all of that is done uh, verbally. None of it is with um, finger dexterity or, or touching a computer. So on my iPhone, um, you probably even be able to hear it. Um, but I would just say, hey, Siri. And you can hear it clicks in automatically. Right. So I can do all those things by dictating now. And, you know, I, I would have times, you know, I, I think this sounds like a small little thing, but 
I would have times where I was in bed, you know, I, I didn't want to watch TV anymore, but I couldn't get to sleep. What can I do? And I'm basically staring at the ceiling. But, you know, for the last four or five, I can't remember how many years I've had this now, I can just say, you know, I won't say it again, so my phone will beep, but I can just ask them to play podcast this or podcast that right. or play some music or all just verbally. I don't have to be able to touch the yeah. phone at all. And, and you know, uh, a neat thing, and it sort of goes to more of the work challenges, I think. And I know this through Tetra that I've worked at for many, many years is that We've had many times at Tetra where um, somebody was basically hired at the job, but part of the job required that they communicate via text with their colleagues. Huh. Uh, this person didn't have the dexterity or another client didn't even have arms. And how could they do that? Well, now uh, I think it's as of... 2020, I believe it is, um, you know, you can dictate, as I said, that, that, that came in a long time ago. But one thing that Apple phones, iPhones have now is automatic answer. So it, their colleagues could call him at any time, and he doesn't have to hit a button to answer the phone, it'll just pick up automatically. Okay. So now he can communicate at any time with any of his colleagues, whether they're back in the um, warehouse or at the front desk or doesn't matter. He can be anywhere and he can, without having to touch the uh, computer or the phone, I should say, um, you know, do those things. So it, it's really coming along quickly. Um, I don't, I'm not involved in the high school anymore. Um, so I don't know how quickly people with disabilities are picking up on all this technology. Right. I know it's definitely accelerated. There's no doubt about it, especially with little things like, you know, the, the glasses and there's screen readers that, you know, you can now just, you know, pass the screen reader over top of uh, text and a voice will just read it out to you right away. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there's lots of things that are, leveling the playing field, I would just, you know, I, one of the things that I would love to be able to do more as a, a research is go back into the high school, um, go back to work with the coalition, and just start talking to people with disabilities. How are you making out? Yeah. Because some exactly. of the stuff accelerates and levels the playing field. And for others, it actually widens the gap and leaves them behind further. Yeah, that's a really interesting point. And Nate said something interesting in the chat too that was directed at Amanda, which was, you know, having a quote unquote invisible disability, you know, I you did express some difficulty already in, in asking for accommodations at work. Um, you know, this is a huge thing in accessible employment and like equal opportunities for employment as Glenn was talking about before. Do you have any tips? I can't believe how fast these things go by. But do you have any quick tips for um, people maybe dealing with an invisible disability in how to ask for accommodations, especially you just said you started a new job. Any advice? Um, I, I don't want to give advice because I think that often puts the onus on the disabled person to yeah. do something properly. And in my experience and in stories that I've heard, it's never the disabled person who has done things, asked for something improperly, um, not, not, you know, asked in the right way or, you know, could have asked in a better way. It is a, an institutional thing. It's an institutional culture thing. I've experienced some very horrible um, pushback around the accommodations I need because my uh, whether they're technology or whether they're non-technological. Uh, and, and, and I do think it's connected to the fact that um, my disability is, is not visual. And it's also something that people think they understand uh, because a lot of people have had like a head injury or a concussion, um, but I had to like relearn how to walk and talk at the same time. Like the degree, <laughs> there's a big difference in degree if it's not a difference in kind. 
Um, and so, uh, so yeah, a lot of a lot of people in power who uh, could refuse me accommodations have questioned my need for them, have suggested that I'm lying about my that I'm lying, and apparently my doctors are lying about my need for them. Um, and as I was saying before, I waited 15 months for something that my doctor said that I needed, which was um, a voice to text solution. Um, that's in my mind. That's I, I'm fairly certain that that is illegal for an employer to do that, but that was done to me. Um, and so, and I didn't do anything wrong. Um, but I will say like in my next job, at a, um, I had a, a, I had a really lovely experience um, where, you know, I, I said, I, I kind of expressed my needs because I had a computer that I couldn't use. Um, and, um, and, and it was met with care and kindness and it was met with a desire to help. Um, and I had multiple people reach out to try to make, to see what they could do. Um, two people in HR just being like, Hey, what, how can we help you? Do we need to buy you new equipment? What do you need? Like, we're going to, we're going to make sure that you're okay. Um, and that you have what you need. Um, so I think, I think it's about, um, I think it's about, you know, the culture at a workplace and not about, um, a, a disabled person. Um, and I'd love to see more, uh, better, <laughs> better cultures. <laughs> Agreed. Totally. Yeah. Thank you for sharing. Um, Alyssa, really quickly, with all the adaptive technology and assistive technology devices that you see, is there a gap anywhere? And what would you really love to see next? Wow. Um, I've got one more. That's, that's a tough question for for two minutes left. <laughs> I've got I've got one more. You're thinking, if you don't mind. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, the the foray of um, self driven cars is kind of just tipping our culture right now. Mm -hmm. I'd love to see companies gearing the self driving te technology of a car towards a person with a disabilities needs rather than Joe Public. Wow. Because if it's accessible for a person with a disability, Joe Public will be able to use it. Self-driving yes. cars are all hype and not actually likely to ever happen. Most mm -hmm. most tech companies have actually shuttered, quietly shuttered their, their self-driving car programs. Really? Yeah. In fact, and in fact, it, disabled people probably wouldn't want it because there was a very prominent company that didn't recognize people in wheelchairs as human and kept running over them mm. with their self-driving cars in their simulations. Uh, yeah. But they're, it's just way too complicated. AI is is not what a lot of people in tech would like it to be. Yet. Yeah. 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 We'll I think you're you're right. right though that transit still is a major gap. Um, as far as people with disabilities are concerned. Absolutely. Um, and as Nate um, pointed out, uh, knowing where to get assistance and, and linking people who require accommodations or require assistive technology to the supports and technology that they need is still a major gap um, in BC and, and everywhere, so. Well, yeah, I was just gonna say to close out on my end anyhow, yeah. across Canada, right? It, yeah. is, it is 2022. And the United States had a National Disabilities Act in 1980. So 42 years later, Canada still does not have one. We're trying to develop one right now, but we still do not have one. And with that comes funding sources, or as somebody mentioned before, makes it an obligation for an employer, doesn't leave it up to the disabled person. It, it provides all these levels of, you know, scrutinization and, and uh, you know, we still don't have that. And I think that's a big failure uh, in Canada and that they're trying to do it now, but. Yeah, they are. The Accessibility Act is in action, yeah. 
Totally. Um, so many good points and I could talk to you all for another hour. Nate, thanks for all of your great insight in the chat and thank you for being here. I did put my email address in the chat. If anyone wants to email me any um, sort of links, helpful links for funding or any devices that have worked really well for you or your clients, I would love to put these up on our resource page on the website. Um, and again, just thank you so much for your time. If you are around on Friday, we are having an accessible community forum on accessible housing in BC. It's gonna be a really uh, big, good chat. So I put the link there for Eventbrite as well. Thank you, everybody. I appreciate your time. Have a great rest of the week and Thank stay you. in touch. Good job, everybody. Bye. Cheers. Bye. 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 Thanks, Causer. Hey.